Book 3, Chapter 85, Brahma describes his own experience as the sign. Vashishta continued, I will relate to you, Rama, agreeably to your request, the story that Brahma himself told me of old. The mind, Manas, produced Manu, the progeny of the mind, who beget the Manujas, otherwise called men, Manavas or Manurashas, the offspring of the mind. Once before, I had asked the lotus-born God to tell me how these hosts of creation had come to being. Then Brahma, the great progenitor of men, granted my request and related the story of the ten Aidava moon-like brothers in his loud voice. And Brahma said, All this visible world is the manifestation of the divine mind. Like circling whirlpools and rippling swirls of water on the surface of the sea. Hear me tell you how I personified mind first awoke on the day of creation in a former kalpa by my volition to create or expand myself. Previously, I remained alone, quietly intent upon the creation at the end of the prior day kalpa. I had compressed the whole creation in the focus of my mind and hid it under the gloom of the primeval night. At the end of the chaotic night, I awoke from a deep sleep and performed my morning prayers, as it is the general law of all living beings. I opened my eyes with a view to create the fixed look on the emptiness all about me. As far as I could see, it was empty space, covered by darkness, with no light of heaven. It was unlimitedly extensive, all void and without any boundary. Being then determined to bring forth creation, and with the acuteness of my understanding, I began to discern the world in its simple, ideal form within me. Then I saw in my mind great cosmos of creation, yet obstructed and apart from me in the wide extended field of emptiness. Then the rays of my reflection stretched out over them from amidst the lotus cell of my abode and sat in the form of 10 lotus-born brahmas over the 10 worlds of this creation. Like so many swans brooding upon their eggs, then these separate orbs, cosmic eggs, brought forth multitudes of beings to light within their transparent aqueous atmospheres. Thence sprang the great rivers and the roaring seas and oceans, and thence again rose the burning lights and blowing winds of the sky. The gods began to play in this ethereal air. Men moved about on the earth, and demons and serpents were confined in their homes under the ground. 
the wheel of time turned with the revolution of season and their produce and adorned the earth with their various productions by change of the seasons. Laws were fixed for all things on all sides and human actions were re regulated in the Smriti scriptures as right or wrong and producing the reward of heaven for the torments of hell as their fruits. All beings pursue their enjoyments and liberty, and the more they strive for their desired objects, the better they thrive in them. In this way, the seven worlds and continents, the seven oceans and the seven boundary mountains were brought into existence and they continue to exist until their final dissolution at the end of a Kalpa period. The primeval darkness from the face of open lands fled before the light and took its refuge in mountain caverns and hollow caves. It abides in some places allied with night as in the shady and sunny forest lands and moss. The blue sky, like a lake of blue lotuses, is haunted by fragments of dark clouds, resembling swarms of black bees on high. The stars that twinkle in it are like the yellow filaments of flowers shaken by the winds. The huge heaps of snow setting in the valleys of high hills resemble the lofty cottonwood trees beset by their pods of cotton. The earth is surrounded by the polar mountains serving as her girdles, and the circles of polar seas serve as her sounding anklets and trinkets. She is covered by the polar darkness as if by a blue garment and studded all about with gems growing and glowing in the bosoms of her rich and ample mines and seas. The earth covered by the ornaments of her greenness a vegetation resembles a lady sitting dressed in her robes, having the produce of rice for her food and the busy buzz of the world for her music. The sky appears like a bride veiled under the black covering of night with glittering chains of stars for her jewels. Seasonal fruits and flowers hanging in the air resemble wreaths of lotuses about her body. The orbs of worlds appear like beautiful pomegranate fruits containing all their peoples in them, like the shining seeds in the cells of those fruits. Bright moonbeams stretching both above and below and all around the three sides appear like white sacred threads girding the world above and below and all about are like the Ganges River running in three directions in the upper, lower and nether world. The clouds dispersing on all sides with their glittering lights, appear like leaves and flowers of airborne forest, blown away by the breezes on all sides. But all these worlds with their lands and seas, their skies and all their contents, are in reality as unreal as visionary dreams and as delusive as the enchanted city of a fairyland. 
the gods, demons, men, and serpents, seen in multitudes in all worlds, are like bodies of buzzing gnats, fluttering about fig trees. Here, time is moving on with its train of moments and minutes, his ages, yugas, and kalpas, in expectation of the unforeseen destruction of all things. Having seen all these things in my pure and enlightened understanding, I was quite confounded to think from them where all these could have come into being. Why is it that I do not see all that I perceive with my visual organs, like a magic scene? spread out in the sphere of my mind. Having looked into these for a long time and with steadfast attention, I called to me the brightest sun of these luminous spheres and addressed him saying, Approach me, O God of gods, luminous sun. I welcome you to me. Having approached, I said, tell me what you are and how this world, with all its bright orbs, came to being. If you know anything of this, please reveal it to me. Thus being addressed, he looked upon me, and then having recognized me, he made his salutation and uttered in graceful words and speech. The son replied, O Lord, you are the eternal cause of these false phenomena. How is it that you do not know it and ask me about its cause? But should you, all knowing as you are, take delight in hearing my speech, I will tell you of my unasked and unthought of production, which I beg you to listen to. O great spirit, this world is composed of reality and unreality in its twofold view. It beguiles understanding to take it for something, or sometimes for a real and at others for an unreal thing. It is the great mind of the divine soul that is employed in this constant and unceasingly endless creation for its diversion. Chapter 86, the son's story of Hindus and his wife's tapas, and their ten sons, the Aindavas. The son continued. It was, my lord, only the other day of one of your previous kalpas, at the foot of a mountain, beside the tableland of Mount Kailash that stands in a corner of the continent of Asia. That there lived a man named Suvarnajanta, together with his sons and their progeny, who had made that place a beautiful and pleasant home. Among them lived a Brahmin named Indu, a descendant of the patriarch Kashapa, who was a saintly soul, virtuous and acquainted with divine knowledge. He resided in his house with all his relatives and passed this time agreeably in company with his wife, who was as dear to his heart as if his second son. But this virtuous couple had no children, as no grass grows in sterile soil. And the wife, 
remain discontent at the unfruitfulness of her blossoming or seed. With all the purity and simplicity of their hearts, and the beauty and gracefulness of their persons and manners, they were as useless to the earth as the fair and straight stem of the pure rice plant without its stalk of grains. The unhappy couple left for the mountain in order to make their tapas for the blessing of children. They ascended Mount Kailash, which lacked any shade from shade trees and was uninhabited by living beings. They stood there fixed on one side like a couple of trees in a barren desert. They remained in their austere, austere tapas, subsisting upon liquid food, which also supported the trees. At the close of day, from the hollow of their palms, they drank only a sip of water from a neighboring cascade. They remained standing and unmoved as immovable trees and continued long in that posture in the manner of an erect wood in heat and cold. In this manner, they passed two ages before their meditations met with the approval of the God who bears the crescent of the moon on his forehead, Shiva. The God with the cooling moonbeams on his forehead advanced toward the parched hair, like when the moon casts their dewy light upon trees and lotuses dried and scorched under the burning sunbeams of the summer day. The God appeared to them mounted on his milk-white bull and clasping the fair Oma, goddess Parvati, on his left and holding the beaming moon on his head like spring season approaching green shrubs, strewing flowers upon them. The couple's faces and eyes brightened as they saw the God, just like lotuses hail the appearance of the beautiful moon. They bound down to the God of the silvery crescent and snow white face. Then the God rising to their view, like the full moon, and appearing in the midst of the heaven and earth, smoke spoke smilingly to them in a gentle and audible voice. The breath of that voice refreshed them, like the breath of spring revives the faded plants of a forest. Shiva said, I am pleased with your meditation, O Brahman. Offer your prayers to me and have your desire reward granted to you immediately. The Brahman replied, O Lord of Gods, please favor me with ten intelligent male children, if these be born to dispel all my sorrows. The son continued. The God said, be it so, and then disappeared into the air.
his great body pass through the ethereal path with a tremendous roar of thunder like the surge of the seas. Then the Brahmin couple return to their home with gladness in their hearts. They appeared like the reflections of the two gods, Shiva and Uma. After returning, the Brahmani became big with child from the blessing she received from her god Shiva. In her pregnant state, she looked like a thick cloud, heavy with rainwater. In proper time, she brought forth a boy as beautiful as the digit of the new moon. In this way, she bore 10 sons in succession, each as handsome as the tender sprouts of plants. They grew up in strength and stature and were invested with the sacramental bread. In course of time, they attained their boyhood and became conversant with the language of the gods, Sanskrit. Like the mute clouds become loud in their rainy season, they shone in their circle with the luster of their bodies as the resplendent orbs of the sky burn and turn about in their spheres. In time, these youths lost both parents who passed off their mortal coils to go to their last abode. Losing both parents, the 10 Brahmin lads left their home in grief and went to the top of Mount Kailash to pass their helpless lives in mourning. Here they discussed what would be best for them. What would be the right course to take? to avoid the troubles and miseries of life. They talked with one another on such topics as what was the best good of humanity in this world of mortality and many other subjects, such as what is true greatness, best riches and affluence, and the highest good of humankind. What is the good of great power, possession, being chief, or even the gain of a kingdom? What forms the true dignity of kings and the high majesty of emperors? What avails the rule of the great Indra? which is lost in one moment of Brahma. What endures a whole trauma and what must be the best good as the most lasting. <clears throat> as they were talking in this manner, they were interrupted by the eldest brother <clears throat> with a voice as that of the leader of a herd of deer to the attentive her. Of all kinds of riches and dignities, there is one kind that endures for a whole kalpa and is never destroyed. This is the state of Brahma, which I prize above all others. Hearing this, the good sons of Indu exclaimed in, well, one voice. Ah, well said. Then they honored the eldest with kind speeches. They said, how, O oh brother, is it possible for us to attain the state of Brahma, who is seated on his seat of lotuses, 
and is adored by all in this world. The eldest then replied to their younger brothers, saying, O oh, you, my worthy brothers, do as I say, and you will be successful. Sit in lotus posture and think yourself to be the bright Brahma, full of his brilliance and possessing the powers of creation and annihilation in yourself. Well, this is a very interesting section that we're reading here. Let's talk about it and think about it for a moment. It seems that in chapter 85, Brahma is describing his own experience. Brahma, the creator of the universe. He's describing how he created the universe. And during this whole description, he comes to a point in which he's unable to perceive the rest of his universe. At that point, he's wondering what's happening. In verse 32, he says, why is it that I do not see all that I perceive with my visual organs, like a magic scene spread out in the sphere of my mind? <clears throat> So that is a curious experience for the creator of the universe to have, isn't it? He's relating in his memory all that he has done. And then he realizes there's much that I cannot see. So he approaches one of the dream creatures that he created the luminous sun. Uh, and the sun is called Surya. And Surya is said to be an incarnation of Vishnu, the maintenance property of the universe. So he's basically asking one of his dream creatures to describe the universe to him. So here's the creator of the universe asking a dream creature to describe the universe to him. That's an unusual kind of thing, I would think. How is it that the creator of the universe somehow has forgotten or cannot see all that he has created? So we have quite a mystery here, don't we? And the son, Surya, says, you created me after all. How is it you do not know it and ask me about its cause? So the son is even a little bit surprised that the creator would come to him with this request. But he honors the creator as knowing all, even though the creator claims he does not. And he thinks, well, maybe you just want to hear me talk. So oh, very well, I will speak. So then he begins to relate this story of Hindu and his wife's tapas in order to acquire 10 sons. So that's a curious way to begin. 
to describe how the universe arose. It seems like, well, it's clear that this dream of the universe is sort of folding back upon itself. It's beginning to operate in a way that's very similar to dreams we might have. When we have a dream, what's going on in the dream? There may be a substantial stretch of time where everything is moving ahead in a very orderly fashion and appears to be quite consistent. And then suddenly the dream changes. And maybe even what we dreamed, we begin to dream again. We have a repeat of the same dream over again. Well, we understand this to be caused by the rather chaotic and unorderly laying down of individual karmic traces. You know, as we are proceeding incarnation after incarnation in all the various forms and in the human forms, and we act in a way that is contrary to the divine will, the divine karmic traces, then we create karma. And that karma is recorded as a karmic trace that is somehow attached to us, becomes a part of our memory. And we seem to have a memory that we don't remember. We don't remember how we created this karmic trace, this craving for something or this tendency for that, which we know is not in accord with divine karmic traces. Yet there it is. Where did that come from? Where does this fear of water come from? Where does this particular quality of green eyes. Where did that come from? And so we don't know where these things come from, do we? And then we're having a dream and this almost random sort of karmic trace raises up and we run off down that track and the dream changes. Well, it appears that this is also the way divine karmic traces are being laid down. Think about that for a moment. Perhaps we thought the divine karmic traces would be extremely orderly in their progression as they're arising. We understand that the thinking of the, or the performance of Sanyama on the Rig Veda seems to be extremely orderly process. We go from the first syllable to the second, to the third, to the fourth, like that. That would seem to be laying down perfect tracks of karmic traces. But now we're beginning to get an understanding that perhaps it's not that orderly after all. And in fact, something very surprising is revealed. As these 10 sons lost their parents, they went away into the mountains to try to figure out, now what should we do? 
We have no parents. We have no one to guide us. We're on our own. We have to figure this out. And one of them, the eldest, says, why don't we become Brahma? Why don't we become the creator of the universe? If we do that, then we have a occupation that will last us for a whole kalpa. What could be better than that? So all the brothers agree. What a fabulous idea. Let us become the creator of the universe. And then the eldest brother says, here's how we do it. We sit in lotus posture and think yourself to be the bright Brahma. Is this familiar at all? <laughs> what are we doing every day? Seven times a day. In the Sahasra Sirsha Brahma meditation. In fact, what exactly do we do? Aham, Ramasmi is one of our sutras, isn't it? Where we sit in lotus posture and we perform sanyama on being the bright Brahma, full of his brilliance and possessing the powers of creation and annihilation in yourself. So we are literally reenacting a scene from the Yoga Vashishta right now in what we call real time. I think that's quite curious. And also what we have discovered here is that the universe is not as orderly as we might in our minds think it to be. It has been said by Maharishi that the course of karma is unfathomable. Unfathomable, that means you're never ever going to figure out the karma. You're never going to understand all the different aspects of your own individual karmic traces. They are such an intense, huge, vast configuration of random activities that you'll never understand it. And we know that everything, including now we see karmic, individual karmic traces is just a reflection of something of a higher order. This is how the universe works. This is how all existence works. This is how projection from pure consciousness works. It is a projection of full potentiality within the unmanifest. And then that manifests into something, something that exists. And then from that something that exists, 
another thing manifests, doesn't it? And the thing, the first thing that existed, we say that is of a higher order, and the thing that it produced that is of a lower order, and it is like a replica of itself. And so the universe is creating replicas upon replicas upon replicas of the primordial thing that was produced from pure consciousness. And by the way, the thing that was produced from pure consciousness is eternal, which means it never had a beginning and it will never have an end. So we're being confronted here with an unsolvable riddle. And this is what is being revealed to us here in the Yoga Vashishta, that within the creation of Brahma, many of the dream creatures apparently also strive to become the Brahma and apparently do become Brahma. And the Brahma that was speaking recently in chapter 85 is apparently one of those beings who became Brahma from being a dream creature. We know this because the previous Brahma couldn't remember everything. He could only remember part of it. And now these brothers are going to become Brahma and they're going to have that same experience, aren't they? And you and I are going to become Brahma and we're going to have that same experience. When we realize Aham Brahmasmi, after sitting in our lotus posture and performing Sanyama on that sutra for some time, we are going to realize that we are the creator of this universe. But it's not that simple, is it? When we have this realization, we're also going to be able to go in our memory as the creator of the universe and explore what have we done? How have we created this universe? And lo and behold, we're going to discover gaps in our own memory of the creation of this universe. So I think this puts things in a little bit of perspective for us. What we are endeavoring to accomplish in the Sahasra Sirsha Brahma meditation and what we can expect to be the result. We're performing this meditation to become the creator of the universe. And as this group of 1000 continues to form, eventually we reach that critical mass of 1,000 Sahasra. And when we reach that critical mass of 1,000, this cell of 1,000 beings meditating together in one time, in one place, in this case, a virtual place, a Zoom conference room, but still a place, is going to be the creator of the universe. 
that cell of 1,000 people, 1,000 minds. And then within that cell of 1,000 minds, one or two or three or five or 10 or 50 or 100 or 500 of us are also going to have this realization and be the creator of this universe. So quite the adventure revealed here today in the yoga machine.